So we're starting this new series called Seeds, um, as this little booklet shows. Um, let me talk to you a little bit about what we're starting today. It's a special, it's a special day. You're here on the right day, y'all. Um, you know, all this rain tried to stop you, you would not be stopped, okay? It's, it's going to be really, really good. This series that we're starting about seeds, you know, I, I don't know much about farming. I really don't. Um, well, I did have one growing project growing up, but it wasn't legal like it is now. That's all. Okay. I just like, I just like to get that out of the way. You know, if you're new here and you're like, oh, this pastor got a past. Okay. We like to get that out of the way first. So if you get up to use the restroom right now, I know why it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, but that's, that's kind of like the extent of what I know about farming, about seeds. What I didn't know then, what I do know now is that my interest in seeing things grow is actually God's design in me. And now it's taken its rightful role as me being a developer of people. And so that is something really special about this concept of seeds. Praise the Lord. I've moved on to seeing people grow, amen, <laughs> instead of anything else, all right? I'm not going to do anything like that. But maybe, maybe like me, you've seen some things grow in your life that weren't the best, that, um, you know, that produced death. Uh, maybe your marriage is kind of growing into something you're not really looking forward to being part of, and maybe your kids aren't doing what you'd hoped they'd do. Uh, maybe you're in school and you're struggling. Maybe you're, you're young and you're starting to see different paths to go down, and you're cool on the outside, but on the inside, you're stressed, you're anxious, and you're seeing things grow in your life that you're not too excited about. Let me tell you this about this series. Uh, bad things grow naturally. Okay, let's get that out of the way. Bad things grow naturally. You don't have to try. You don't have to add anything to that, but life grows intentionally. Anything worth having, you gotta, you gotta put a little bit into that. Any, any kind of life worth having, you gotta put a little bit of energy into that. So we gotta be intentional about this. We gotta grab a guide today, and on your way out of church, I want you to stop by that wonderful U-shaped situation back there, and I want you to sign up for a group. Okay, because this is going to be so life-changing for you. Why do we keep doing groups? Why do we keep launching groups? Twice a year we do this. Why do we keep doing it? Because it works. People grow. People get freedom. They, they find freedom and they go through seasonal development in life. And we keep doing it because we like doing what works around here, okay? So get one of these. One of these guides is free to every single person who signs up for a group. Um, there's eight sections in it and eight parts of this series. Um, it's free to you because of the generous givers of Lifeline Church. And so there's nothing standing in your way to getting one of those except for your apprehension about joining a group. I get it, y'all. I do. I, I understand this. Um, I've been going to groups for a, a really long time. I know it's tough to get in groups. I've been leading groups. I've been in groups. And I, I, I get the same feelings you get. I'm too busy. I'm too awkward to be in this group of people. They're going to find out how, how silly I really am, you know? Um, how about this? I'll be fine without one. You know, I'll just watch the latest Huberman podcast, and everything's going to be fine for me. You like that? You like Huberman? Yeah, I thought you would. After years of being in and leading groups, I have never regretted being in a group. Never. Never have I ever said, well, that was a huge waste of time. Never. <laughs> Because something, something spiritual happens when we, when we put ourselves out there and get involved in a group, you will grow. You will grow. I've never regretted doing it, and you won't regret it either. It's always been a blessing because it's God's design. Look, Bible people have been growing this way for thousands of years. This is how people, this is basic Christianity 101. They met from the temple each week, and then they met from house to house throughout the week. This is just basic Christianity, really. So we're not trying to do anything new. We're not trying to do anything special. We're just trying to do what the Bible shows us to do is that we need to be together with people. We need to be, we need to be growing in community together. So I'm going to do my best to keep this message tight today. I said I'm going to do my best, okay? I'm going to do my best to keep it tight so that you have as much time as possible to go back there, look through all the groups, and get involved in all that. Amen? Amen. All right, let's talk about this. Uh, the principle of the seed is found throughout Scripture throughout scripture. Essentially, God loves growth and he wants you to grow. And you can grow if you're willing, but growth tomorrow starts today. That's the first note for you. Love for you to jot that down. It's kind of something we'll come back to over and over again. Your growth tomorrow starts today. You have to invest in it. Growth doesn't happen instantly. It takes time. It takes careful attention. And this is the power and the principle 
of the seed. Let's dive into God's word today and see what God has to say about this principle. And I, I hope that you just get so much out of this because this is God's design. Let's listen to Genesis 1. Genesis 1 says this, God said, let the land sprout with vegetation, every sort of seed bearing plant and trees that grow seed bearing fruit. These seeds will produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. And that is what happened. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed bearing plants and trees with seed bearing fruit. Their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. What was it? Good. It was good. That's right. God spoke trees, plants, seeds, all that stuff into existence. Then what he did, he gave it to you and me. Yeah. He gave all that stuff to you and me. It goes on in uh, just a few verses later in Genesis 129. God says, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. So, so God gives Adam and essentially all of us the responsibility to, to care for these plants and trees. Seeds grow most properly when they're cared for by human beings. That's why when you drive down, you drive down Woodbridge Road over here, you don't see all these farmers just scatter out their grape seed and say, well, you know, they're gonna grow on their own. No, no, no. You see, it's all the, all the rows, all the aisles, all the careful attention because seeds produce at the maximum efficiency when human beings are involved in their cultivation. That's a principle, all right? So there's seeds in you. There's potential in you. But when we get involved, and that's God's design for you to be involved in your own growth. Are you starting to see this? This is God's principle. This is the principle of the seed. We have a part to play. And it's always been that way. In Genesis 8, it says this, as long as the earth remains... There will always be planting, harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, and night. Like this is, this is how it's going to be, all right? Don't, don't hold your breath for it to change. No, it's going to be this way. After the flood, you know the story in, uh, in Genesis 7. There's a, there's a flood, and, and God gives the mandate to, uh, you know, to, to Noah, put all the animals in the boat, all that. But God himself preserves the seeds. He preserves the seeds, um, the, here's a funny thing. I, I just got this little slide for you here. There's actually a facility where people are trying to do God's job. Um, there it is right there. This is actually uh, like, a, like a seed preservation facility. This is in Norway right here. It's actually called the Doomsday Vault. So basically what people did, they built this vault right here. And, you know, if there's a nuclear war or whatever, like I want there to be oranges, I want there to be apples, I want there to be nectarines, we're going to keep them right here. And they think they're, they're doing God's job preserving the seeds, you know, but if God wants them to be gone, check it out. They're going to be gone. All right. You know what their heart, you know what their biggest challenge is with this facility? Keeping the seeds from growing. That's their biggest challenge. That's the hardest thing for them to do because any kind of moisture gets in there, bloop, they start to like, and then they don't have a seed anymore. That's the hardest. Seeds going to grow. That's what I'm trying. Seeds going to grow. They're trying to keep them from growing, but they're not growing. If they do grow, like, and they're just going to grow, any kind of like humidity, they have to keep it all, seeds grow. He made you that way too. God made you that way. There is potential in you. There, is, there are seeds of growth and potential in you, but it's up to us to cultivate that. So why are seeds important to God? That's a great question to ask. And it's the next section in your notes. If you are taking notes with us, um, the first reason why seeds are important to God is because seeds grow into trees. And I didn't know this until I really started diving into this nice workbook right here, but, but trees are the third most common noun in the Bible. It goes God, people, then trees, all right? It, it must have been important enough for God to put it in his top three. I mean, um, Genesis uh, starts with a tree, Revelation ends with a tree. They're just trees throughout the whole thing, and its seeds turn into trees. So it's important enough for God to say, this is how I want to show you how life works, I mean, God could have created the earth any old way he wanted to, but he chose this way. So that's kind of important. Uh, another reason seeds are important to God is because Jesus loved parables and many of his parables featured seeds. Why did Jesus use parables so much? This is a sidebar, but Jesus used parables so much, I believe, because it kept arrogant people away and it kept humble people close. It's like a, a, a Jesus tells a parable about, about trees or whatever and all the arrogant people, all the Pharisees, whatever, are just like, ah, pff, whatever, stupid story. Who you think, who's this guy thinking? And, then they, and I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense, whatever. But humble people will be like, what do you mean by that? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Tell me more. What do you mean the seed fell on this kind of path, that kind of path? What, what, do you, what do you mean? It keeps humble people close, keeps arrogant people far. Jesus likes stories. Selah. Be humble. Okay, that's all I'm trying to tell you on that. Why are, why are seeds important to God? I'll tell you another reason. God calls his word a seed. God calls his word a seed. Um, that is found in um, Isaiah 55. Let me read it to you. The rain and the snow come down from heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. 
They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. All right, God's word is a seed. One of the groups I'm leading on, on Wednesdays um, is called OSL. Uh, it's called Operation Solid Lives. We've been doing it for a long time. It's, it's uh, actually created by a four score pastor down south called, his name is Jerry Dearman. I don't know if we'd get him on a Wednesday night. I don't think we can afford that, but uh, maybe one day. I am, I am friends with him, so there is a chance. <laughs> um, but he's awesome. He's uh, like an incredible leader, incredible pastor, but it's like a boot camp. Anybody that's like gonna try to sign up for that one, you need to know something about that one. It's, it's kind of hard, all right? There's lots of homework, scripture memorization, all right, so just know that on the front end, I would love to get skunked by all the other groups. There's 19 groups to choose from over there. Plenty for you to choose from that aren't as hardcore as the one I'm gonna do. But why do we do that? Why do we do scripture memorization? I'll tell you why. It's because it's a seed planted in your heart that will grow and produce good things in your life. That's why we need to bury his word deep in our heart. His, his word is like a seed. Parents, you can do this with your kids. You can, you can, you can plant scripture in their hearts, reading the Bible together, have one verse that you say together, uh, like each week, you know, I've seen Tiffany do this with our own kids. Uh, just like, you don't have to make it homeworky, you know, just kind of do it with them. It's, it won't return void. You won't regret it because they will grow. Uh, another reason God loves uh, seeds is because Jesus is a seed. Now, some of you might not realize this, but Jesus talks about himself like a seed. I'll show you in John 12. John 12 says this, Jesus said, now the time has come for the son of man, he's talking about himself, to enter into his glory. And then watch this. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. He's like, I'm gonna die, go in the ground, but I'm not gonna stay dead. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna sprout out and I'm gonna produce 10, 100, 100 billion times more than I would if I was just one wise man living for one lifetime. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die, go in the ground. He did not stay dead though. And that's the thing with seeds. God calls Jesus a seed. He died, went in the ground, came back up. I, I gotta tell you this, um, warning, this is as hardcore as I get, okay? <laughs> Without the seed of Jesus Christ in your life, you're nothing but a dead field. I like to, I like to hit, hit you hard with a nice big smile on my face. This is my Joe Osteen face, okay? This is how. <laughs> Tiffany and I have been praying about you. We decided there's a champion in you. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> We've been praying and we might have decided there might be a demon in you too. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, 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 no. I'm, I, I'm being serious. Without Jesus, your life is, is dead. You need Jesus. We need Jesus. He is the one seed that we need in our life. If we don't get any other, we need Jesus in our life because without Jesus, our life is a dead field. We are a dead field without, without him. And so why are seeds important to us? Why are seeds important to us? I think it's like, I, I, I thought that it might, there might be a temptation to be like, what's, what's this weird concept? You know, the seeds, you know, here, I'm like, I'm the seed, the power of the seed. And I blink really weird. The, the secret seed code. We're going to unlock the secret power of the seed. You know, it's, not, it's not weirdness, okay? It's not just some like New Year's thing we're doing. It's not just imagery for imagery's sake. Like this is God's, like this is, this is God. This is, this is the word of God talking about seeds throughout scripture. And it's true for us. This is not some spiritual weirdness. This is not, oh, we're going to like some secret seed thing. Oh, other other Christians don't know about this. No, it's not, it's not like that. This is supposed to be, I believe, obvious, but sometimes we just need things explained to us. And so it's not a life hack. This is not the weird seed code. Understanding God created the world to have seeds and fruit, seeing how God calls his word a seed and his son a seed causes us to be dependent on him for every good thing in our life. In fact, I would say it this way. You could write this down. The principle of the seed is meant to create connection and cooperation with God. This is relational. I mean, think about it, a seed and a fruit, it's a lot like a, a mother and their child. Like this is relationship, this is family. This is the way that we're supposed to connect with God in, in a way that's, that's, this is not formulaic. This is not some formula. We're all prone to formulas, okay? Like just give me the, just give me the process, tell me what I need to do, 
No, this is relationship. This is connection. This is deeper. This is, this is relationships are work. Formula is just plug and play. This is relationship. So it's very, very important we understand that this is a relational journey. Um, seeds have potential. But the big difference between someone knowing about the seeds principle and knowing how to apply it is a vast difference. So I want you to have both. I want you to understand this principle, but I also want you to know how to apply it. So that's how we'll finish our time together today. First, I want you to understand the principle of the seed. And so the first thing I want to share with you about this principle is the seed has potential whether you plant it or not. This seed, like you could have a seed in your hand and it's, it's got growing potential. Whether you plant it, whether you cultivate it or not, it's got potential there. There have been found, there have been found ancient wheat seeds in like the pyramids. You know, thousands of years later, they have growing potential in them. So what I'm trying to tell you is you are not too ancient. I knew it. I knew you would go there. I'm just saying. You're not too ancient. I don't care if you're 70, 80, 90 years old. You got growth you could still achieve. I don't care how young you are. You think, oh, well, that growing stuff, that going to life groups, oh, reading my Bible, oh, getting close to the heart of Jesus. There's no junior Holy Spirit. There's a Holy Spirit for all of us. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're not too burned out. You don't have too many tattoos. You don't have not enough tattoos. Oh, I need a testimony if I'm a good Christian. No, some people think they have too much of a testimony and some people think they don't have enough of a testimony. You are not too anything to grow with God. Amen, somebody. I mean, this is for everybody. That's the power and potential of a seed is whether you plant it or not, it's there. You got it. You got it. I'm, I'm trying to look. It's dark in here. I'm, I'm looking at all of you. You have potential to grow. God has placed that in you. He's, 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 he's put that in you. And so the next, the next thing about this principle is the seed requires the right environment to realize its potential. I'm going to say that again because I do want to slow down on this point for just uh, a few because this is really really important. The seed requires, any seed requires the right environment to grow. You need the, you need the right environment. So let me, let me translate that. That's a parable, a seed. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about churches. I'm talking about our church. That's why we here at Lifeline, we geek out on values, on strategy, on our mission. We say it every week and we do a... Like I've, I've heard people say, like we do a value every single week in our little uh, pre-service rally. It's always a value. And we're always talking about know God, find community, discover your purpose, be a lifelong. Like why? we're geeked out on it. We're geeked out. Why? Because seeds require the right environment to grow. We're obsessed with environment because everybody got seeds. Everybody, and we're no better than anybody else. What do we have control over? Our environment. Let me talk to you about our church for just a minute. We create environments and experiences designed to help people grow. The first of that is, is we want people to know God. You see it on the little like starter video, like when it's like the clappy part, right before the clappy part, it says, that's what we call it. Affectionately, we call it the clappy part. I don't know. It says, maybe you've noticed it. It says, know God, find community, discover purpose, be a lifeline. You notice that? Those are staples here. We want people to know God. The first part of the environment I want you to understand is this is a place where people know God and not just know about him. I mean, know him personally. You could be in church 50 years. Amen, everything I say. Mm -hmm, pastor, that's good. But not have a relationship with him. That's what we're obsessed about. We want people to know him intimately. That's why every single week, it's, does anybody, anybody, want to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. And every single week we've been blessed. Every single week people commit and recommit their lives to Jesus in this house every single week. Because why? Because of the environment. It's not just the preaching. It's not just the worship. It starts out in the parking lot. It starts even before that. It starts in our hearts because we tell people from the very beginning, this is an environment we've created that from inside of people's cars, they're holding on to the, to the steering wheel going, I don't know if I want to go in there. This is scary to me. We tell, we, I mean, people's salvation starts with the parking crew. It's an environment. We create environments for seeds to grow. I, I got to move on, but this is so important to the life of this church. That's why I believe it's, it's going so well is because it's the environment is right. The environment's right. So that's no God. The next part of the environment we create is, is finding community. 
finding community, and not just any community, you'll find community in lots of weird places. <laughs> you can find community at the bar, you know what I'm saying? Like you can find community and people will. Yeah. I was always taught um, uh, when I was growing in my leadership, people are gonna group whether you ask them to group or not. Yeah. They'll group up. They'll group up with people from the bar. They'll group up with people from work. They'll group up with people on the pickleball court, whatever that new phenomenon is, that like badminton or whatever it is. I don't know, weird, <laughs> weird stuff. But we just like people to be in healthy groups. <laughs> we want people to, to be in community and, and groups with each other that those are other people that know God and want to get closer to knowing God. And so those kind of groups are the healthiest kind. And so we're creating the environment for you to grow so you can know God, find community, and then we don't stop there. What do we talk about like all the time? Growth track. <laughs> oh, I'm a growth track again. Growth track. Growth track this. Growth track that. Why? It's the environment. Yeah. It's the environment. We're always inviting people to discover their purpose. Every single person who's on the dream team here, every single person that's been through growth track has taken a spiritual gifts test and knows what their spiritual gifts are. Every single one, every single one. We create environments where people can discover their purpose so that they can do what? So that they can be a lifeline. So they can be a lifeline. And the very baseline place where that happens is in the local church. I've heard people say about about ministries, about churches. Oh man, you just like send them out. Get, you know, they'll, they'll do it out in the community. Well, let me tell you this. If you're not greeting people in your own church, you're probably not greeting them in Safeway. Yeah. If, you're not, if you're not ministering to people in your own local church where it's like a safe environment for you to do so, you're probably not ministering them at work. Maybe you are, but I'm, I'm guessing you're struggling with it. So that's why we start right here, right at home, saying this is, the, this is the place where you can develop your gift. This is the place where you can use, you can practice praying with people. You can, it's not just practice, it's real life. It's actual prayer, but you see what I'm saying? It's the local church. Jesus didn't say to Peter, hey, on this rock, I will build my nonprofit. <laughs> hey, on this rock, I'm gonna build my food pantry. Hmm. Hey, on this rock, I'm going to build my recovery center. All good things. Yeah. What did he say? On this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And everything else that the body of Christ is trying to do, the kingdom of God advancing, starts in the local church. So why wouldn't we give every opportunity for people to serve right here so they can develop, they can grow? Why? It's the right environment. It's an environment for growth. Because this principle of seeds is true, it's right, it's accurate, and we want you to grow. And so we try to create environments for you to grow. Like seeds, people need the right environment to grow. That's why we do it like that. And so the next little point I got for you, I told you I was going to take longer on that one. I'm passionate about it. But the next thing I want you to, to consider is the seed requires time to reach its potential. The seed requires time to reach its potential. Uh, let me put it to you this way. Fast don't last, but slow is for shell. Okay. Slow is for show. Hey, you can't, you can't rush God. You could try. A lot of people try, but it, it, it don't fare well for you when you try to rush God. Why? Because God's a farmer. He, he's like, oh, I got to have some seed and then we'll give a little water and then the next season's going to come and then bloop, then finally it'll break out. And then after another year, it'll finally grow up. And then next year we'll have some fruit. God's a farmer. You rush his process. It's just not, it just, you just can't, you just can't, you can, and people do. We put miracle grow on our lives and try and quick fix band-aids, whatever. And what happens? We grow up, no roots fall over. Yeah. That's what, that's what happens. You can't rush God. The seed takes time to develop its potential. Your personal growth is a lot like growing wealth. In fact, I would put it this way. Um, wealth that lasts is gained over time. Let me just put it this way. Wealth from get rich, quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from hard work grows over time. That's a really smart thing to say, isn't it? Good thing Solomon said it first in Proverbs 13, 11. Ah, you thought I came up with that. It's actually a scripture, y'all. It's actually a scripture that you can't rush this. It's a, you're growing your own life is a lot like growing in wealth. Yeah. Is that it takes time. Real wealth that lasts, man, that's why a lot of these people that, that you know, they, they get a the big record deal, or you get, you get these young athletes and they get like millions of dollars, but their character has not been developed. Sure. We've all seen it. We've all seen it. And it, it doesn't go well for them. You cannot rush God's process. Um, unless you're very intentional, you've got, to, you've got to hunker down and let God, let time do its work. Amen. Let time 
do its work. Some seeds lay dormant while others flourish and grow. This is a sad truth, but it's true. I've seen it happen. I mean, we've been pastors here for 12, 13, something like that. A long time now and long enough to see some people that should be bitter, they're growing like crazy. And we've seen other people, man, they got everything. They got all the money. They got a silver tongue. They got, they're all, they're, I mean, they should be doing great, but they are lying dormant. Why? Why? Some seeds lay dormant while others flourish and grow. Every person has the God-given potential, but it's up to the person to cultivate it and see it through. Okay, so how do we realize our potential? Let's wrap this thing up. I want, I want you to have some tools in your belt for this. Number one, focus on the seed and not the fruit. I want you to focus on the seed and not the fruit. This is so big, y'all. This is, this is a huge deal. If you've never been taught this before, lean in, lean in. Focus on the seed, not the fruit. If you focus on the seed and learn to fall in love with cultivating, you'll be amazed at how much you produce. <laughs> People who grow aren't worried about how much fruit they have. They just like the act of cultivating. They just like, they like it. They like the process. Farmers, farmers going to farm. Farmer's going to farm. I'm, I'm on a kick like that today. I don't know why I'm talking like that right now. <laughs> they like watering, digging, the waiting. They don't get frustrated. They enjoy the process, the gym. I see this at the gym. I'm kind of a gym rat myself lately. I've been more of a gym rat lately, and I see this. I, there's two kinds of people. There's kinds of people that are obsessed with meal prepping, their diet. They're obsessed with their process, and then there's other people obsessed with the mirror. You know what I'm talking about? They're obsessed with their phone on their little tripod. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with all that. You can do all that, but it's a mindset. There's people who are obsessed with the outcome. And then there's people who are obsessed with the process. People who are obsessed with the outcome are consistently frustrated because the fruit never comes fast enough because they don't like the process. They don't like what it takes to get the results. And so they're always like, oh man, here, I got to go in there again and work out again. I see it all the time. And that's why the gym's full in January only. <laughs> I ain't joking. That's, that's real. That's real life. Cause those, those people, <laughs> those people, some, some of us, all of us need to, all of us need to realize this. All of us need to recognize our, our capacity to, to be this way. We don't enjoy the process. Oh, we all want God's seed planted in our heart, but no one wants to spend 45 minutes a day reading their Bible. That's what I'm talking about right there. If you focus on the fruit, it's always gonna take longer than you want. You'll be consistently frustrated. You'll look around, what's everybody else doing? Where's the miracle grow at? You know what I mean? In the gym is where's that TRT at? Come on, boom. I want some fast results, you know? Some gym rats know exactly what I'm talking about right there. They want fruit. They're always frustrated. The real difference between seed people and fruit people is seed people have to be told they have a lot of fruit in their life. They're too busy to even notice how strong they've gotten. They're too busy to notice. They're too busy pouring into their kid's life to realize how good their family really is. They have to be told. And they're like, hey, man, you, or in the gym, you know, like, hey, you're looking really strong. They're like, really? And then they look in the mirror. They're like, oh, that's pretty. Oh, hang on. I got, I got my last set to do. They're obsessed with the process. They have to be told they have a lot of fruit. If you don't like the fruit you have in your marriage, in your family, your career, change the seed. What are you putting in? Fall in love with the process because what you have is a result of what you've been planting. Oh, that's rough. I know it's rough. I know it's rough. I'm, what you have is a result of what you've been planting. Too often we want, we want fruit of seeds that we didn't plant. We plant to our promotions. We plant to our 401k. Meanwhile, we want kids to have good godly values, but haven't done the hard work of planting that seed, taking them to church every week, uh, doing daily devotionals, planting the word of God in their life. Instead, we don't plant anything and we pray for crop failure. Oh, please, Lord, let the, let the fruit that's growing right there not produce. You know, because if you plant oranges, you get? If you plant strawberries, you get? If you plant watermelons, you get? If you plant nothing, you get weeds. Come on, y'all. I've tricked you before. You should know that. You should know that one. You sow nothing, you get death in return. Man, you sow nothing, you get brambles and thorns and stickers and all the nasty, yucky stuff that just blows in on the wind. You plant nothing, you get worse than nothing in return. You plant nothing into your family. I'm 
I'm just, I'm just saying, man, it's, so we pray for crop failure. Please, Lord, let them be so godly and, and go up to be the next pastor. It's like plant seeds that way. If that's what you really want, fall in love with planting those seeds. Then let me show you what this looks like. Um, in the natural, it looks like this seeds you put them in the ground um, and then it's a little sapling with water and then you put some sun and whatever on it turns into a full tree now let me describe to you step by step what this looks like in the spiritual the first one is thoughts that's the seeds are thoughts thoughts come from seemingly random places don't they like oh man so random why do i always think about that so random but are they as random as we think they are we constantly fill our minds with music TV, the places we go, the company we keep. And I would argue that these random thoughts aren't as random as we think. <laughs> That's, that, was, that was good. That was a good one right there. And those thoughts fully formed turn into ideas. Consistent thoughts turn into ideas. Fears, anxieties, thoughts like this become ideas. Well, I'll just go ahead and do this. Uh, it started with a thought before it turned into an idea, and a, solify, a solidified idea becomes a belief. This is, this is where it gets kind of nasty. Um, you believe something will make you feel better or give you relief. Even if you wouldn't say it this way out loud, you believe it deep down. Almost subconsciously, you have these beliefs. You're not consciously thinking about it deep down, though. You believe it. Worse, you end up believing things about yourself, and those beliefs turn into actions. It's what you truly believe that turns into actions. People act on what they believe, not what they say they believe. Yeah. Oh, this, oh, this is real no matter what. People say whatever they want, but people truly act on what they believe. You can say you trust Jesus, but if your thoughts turn to ideas, have a chance to manifest into beliefs, you will act on that. That's why we look at the things we don't want to look at. It's because deep down, we feel it's going to give us relief. We believe it will give us relief. We believe we can get away with it. We believe, you see how this is working? It's very subtle how this goes. But if we have a deep down, and you would never say it, but deep down you believe it. It's gonna be, I'll just, that's why we look at things we shouldn't look at. That's why we eat things we don't eat because, oh, just this once, this is one Twinkie. You know, it's okay. I, I need this right now. I deserve this right now. You would never say it because it sounds silly. But somehow a thought has turned into an idea that's turned into a belief, okay? Because what we believe is what will satisfy, relieve, and that's how we act on it. Of course, that's how you get your results. Your actions lead to your results. That's what everybody knows, but what most people don't know, it starts with your thoughts. It starts with your thoughts. So that's why some people, you hear some people say, don't go to that church. Don't go to Lifeline Church. Don't go to any other church. Don't go to that church, man. They're going to brainwash you in there. Yes! <laughs> Yes, we're going to brainwash you. Some of y'all, we need our brains washed. We do, man. Our, our thoughts and our ideas, they're all junked up, man. We need our brains washed. They're, they're gunked up with all the worst kind of, worst kind of things. Oh, the, these ideas, these beliefs, man, we need to be washed with the water of the word so that our thoughts can change, so that our ideas can change, so our beliefs can change. So what? So our actions can change so that our results can change. Man, let's get brainwashed in the house today. Let's go. I don't care, you tweet about it or whatever. It's not even, it, you can exit or whatever you do. Put it on Facebook. Pastor said I need to get brainwashed. Yeah, I stand by that. I stand by that. We do need to get, I need it too. Why? So that good and true thoughts turn into good and true ideas, turning into good and true beliefs, which will lead will lead to good and true actions, which will lead to good results that you really want. Your spirit man wants it. It's just realizing that this, this process, this idea, this concept of seeds is in effect every minute of every day of our lives. Listen to what, listen to what the word says, James 1. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, what is that? That's giving birth. What? That's a seed turned into a fruit. There's the principle right there. After desire is conceived, it gives birth to what? Sin, which is action. Gives birth to sin. And sin, which full grown, gives birth to the result of death in your life. Or maybe your spiritual life. That's a seed. We need to get our ideas from here. We need to get our thoughts from here. We need to inundate ourselves with this word. That is the, that is the, that's why I'm starting with this. 
That's why we're starting this series with this idea. We've got to fill our minds and our hearts with God's word, the things of God. I woke up to this idea in pretty much every area of my life. I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but just to summarize, you know, I, I'm no better than anyone in here. Let me just put it to you that way. I've had some practice public speaking, okay? I, God has called me to do what I'm doing, but I have had to wrestle with this concept in my own real life. Um, how, about, how about in the area of finances? When Tiff and I first started pastoring, man, the church was a lot different, looked a lot different. It was, it was smaller and there wasn't as much money, and we, but we started having babies, so we wanted to buy a house. Our first house cost $120,000. We didn't know how we were gonna do it. <laughs> it's crazy, right? That's how long ago it was. Our mortgage was 900 bucks, and we didn't know what we were gonna do. We didn't know how we were gonna do it. And so, and, and we, we wanted to be, but we didn't want to ask the church because the church was like, so we didn't have any money there and we didn't know what we were going to do. So we're working all over the place and we we're just trying to make it work. So what did we do? I got on this concept right here and we started putting financial scriptures all over the house on three by five cards, put them all over the house. Why? We started filling our minds with God's truth about our finances. This is not some miracle cure or anything. It just, it began to change our thoughts that turned into our ideas, that turned into our beliefs, that turned into our actions. We started creating budgets and doing things God's way, honoring God with our finances and letting him do the hard work and the heavy lifting of making everything work. I had to wrestle with that personally. You will too. For my family, I had to do this. I've had to, you know, I've had family members that I'm contending for in prayer. I'm, I'm a first generation-ish Christian, you know, church going Christian. Um, but there's, there's certain family members that I want breakthrough for. And so what did I had to learn to do? Devote myself to prayer every single day, like sweaty prayer, you know, like getting in there and, and <laughs> why? And I saw breakthrough. Why? Because I planted that seed. I had to learn. I wasn't getting breakthrough any other way. So I had to turn to God. I had to do it in prayer. I had to do it in my marriage. I've told you the I've told you the story of when I had to get the oil changed. I and mean, some of you are new, you don't know this story, but you know how it is in marriage. The the devil will lie to you about your spouse. <laughs> Anybody who's been married a day knows this. <laughs> the devil will lie to you about your spouse and get, oh, they're mean, they're not nice to you. And so I had to put this practice into into effect and begin to speak out godly things about my wife. She's the best, she's the woman for me. She is absolutely top tier woman of God. And like just saying those things. And then I was walking down the street and I was hopping and people in my neighborhood were like, this fool loaded. But I, what I was really just doing was planting seeds. I was planting seeds. I don't need my ideas. You don't need your ideas. We need God's ideas. We need his thoughts. What does this look like in your relationships? What does this look like in your marriage? What do you need to plant? What seeds do you need to plant in your parenting, for your kids, maybe your business, maybe in your finances, maybe you need to start planting new seeds. What about in your calling? Some of you are called, man. You've got, you've got a calling in you. You've got a gifting in you. That seed is like dormant for so long. When are you going to start planting seeds? I'm, I'm asking you. When you start planting seeds and start thinking God's thoughts for you, start taking that in and letting that grow up to produce results in your life. What about your relationship with your local church and planting seeds about that and not having our own ideas, but having God's ideas? I just, I want to see you grow. I do. If I, if, if I get one thing, I want you to grow in the Lord. That's my, it's like my one job. I want to see that so bad but I know it's in your hands. So I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, what seeds, in, in all those areas I just described, which, which seeds do you need to plant right now? And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna give every single person an opportunity to begin to plant the most important seed of all, Jesus, your relationship with him. Some of you need to plant that seed right here, right now, today. Commit your life to him. Plant that seed and let that dead field become, come back to life. That's free. It's free and it grows just like that. That's the one, man, that salvation seed happens right now. And you can have it, it's all yours. I'm gonna give you that in just a moment. But another seed you can begin to plant is of course, after this, this is not just a preaching angle, man. The, those, those groups are life to you. Those are the people who are gonna be praying for you. Those are the people who are gonna be loving on you because if you find Jesus and, and, and know him and get into a relationship with him, 
it behooves you to have people around that love on you and care for you. So that's how I wanna pray for you today. If we would all bow our heads, close our eyes, let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I just know that there's so many people that are, that are ready to grow, ready to move forward, ready to, to move on to the next stage of their life. So Lord, I just, I, I pray for open hearts and open minds to receive your word today, receive your life today. And if I described you, if, if you're ready, if today is your day, you've been putting it off a little bit, you've been thinking around and you just, you haven't been wanting to make that decision lightly. I'm telling you, you take a step of faith, God will meet you right then and there. He will meet you today. He will meet you today. So if you're ready to commit your life to him, or maybe some of you need to recommit, like this isn't the first time you've done this, but you walked away, man. You, something happened or an event and you drifted. I wanna tell you that God is just as excited to have you back as he was to have you the first time. So if that's you in any way, I just want you to lift your hand right now so I know who I'm praying for. Come on, lift it up high. Amen, I see you. Hallelujah. Amen, I see you. Amen. Is there anyone else? I see you. Amen. I'll just take my time here. This is your moment. This is your moment. Is there anyone else? That's awesome. I'm so proud of you. Church, what I'd love for us to do is pray this prayer together as a family. And, and we can welcome these family members into the kingdom of God. So just pray it right after me, if you would. Say, Father God, Father God I, give you my life. I give you my life. Thank you for sending your son, you sending your son Jesus, Jesus, to die on a cross, on a cross for, my for my sin. Make me new. Make me new. Fill me Fill with your Holy, your Holy Spirit and show me the path, me the path that, I that I should take. Amen. Amen.